These are the oldest stories, online at oldeststories.net. Our story continues with Jehoshaphat as the king of Judah. We've started the last few episodes with him as king because he ruled for a little while, while Israel cycled through three pretty dramatic kings. Jehoshaphat, through the middle of the 8th century, was a stabilizing force for the south at a time when such stability was finally able to transform into some genuine prosperity, which is our focus for today, both in Judah and among the cities on the coast that will soon come to be known as the Phoenician cities. For Jehoshaphat, his name means Yahweh is judge, and he gets pretty high marks for his piety. He personally is credited as holding to the proper biblical faith and also for removing various polytheist shrines from the nation, removing the freedom to worship from his kingdom, and driving the persecuted enemy churches either underground or out of the country entirely. Good on you. He does get a good bit of flack in Chronicles because... Not every high place is completely destroyed, and not every polytheist is slaughtered in the streets or driven out of the country, but overall he is given points for at least making a solid attempt at it. Now, aside from his failure at ecumenicism, Jehoshaphat is credited with perhaps the first missionary work in history. Not the first missionary work ever, but definitely the first that we've seen. He organizes an odd group of people, some government officials, some Levites, and some priests, to go around the country and teach the people from something called the Book of the Law of the Lord. No one has any idea what this book is. Some think it is the first five books of Moses. Some think it's only the first four books. Some think it's only Deuteronomy. Some think it's not a real book at all, but the oral traditions of Moses that would later get incorporated into the Talmud. Some think it's a now lost scripture based on those oral traditions or perhaps based on those first books. Some think it was merely a secular law code, given some added legitimacy through the religious connections that would be standard for any Near Eastern law code. Some think it didn't actually exist at all, because they insist that the Book of the Law of the Lord was actually invented by Hilkiah or Josiah 200 years later. All I can say in all of this is that the more confident someone is, the more wrong they are. Because we're given only two mentions of this book in all of Scripture, and aside from the title and the fact that it's taught by good Yahwists, we know nothing at all about its contents. Despite that, it is pretty clear that this is either an education campaign or a proselytization campaign, and having read through 2,000 years of Mesopotamian history up to this point, I honestly can't remember another time any king has ever tried to actively spread a religious message in this way. Kings fund temples, and temples just sort of sit there and they do the God's work passively. They spread the message passively. I mean, they're working in the temple, but they're not out in the community in the same sense as this? They are out in the community too, though. They do have festivals, and the priests would go around to the people in the community, but, I mean, one imagines that there must have been proselytization of a kind. One guy telling another how great this or that god was, and of course, children would all be taught into the religious system, whichever one they're growing up in, through the festival rituals and the hymns and direct teachings from parents and community members. But my point is to specifically task a group of learned men to go out and teach on religious subjects. Well, it may have happened before but we see no record of it in the written record prior to this. But though this missionary task force gets special mention in Scripture, it's actually only one of many things that Jehoshaphat is doing. 
Domestically, Josephus tells us that he was engaged in a sort of anti-corruption measure, and it may have been related with this proselytization. He sets out new judges and local administrators to replace those who took bribes or who had other complaints against them. He's also building defensive works. He's building storage compounds that could be used for either military logistics or famine relief. The size of his army was apparently quite large. The numbers given in Chronicles are nonsense, of course, but the idea that Philistines and Arabians were sending tribute, and Edom seems to have been in some sort of vassalage, is of a piece with all this. He does seem to make use of all this army and this fortification. We have already seen his involvement in Ahab's wars and the Moabite wars. But while war can be a source of income, it really looks here more like Judah is growing in wealth from the bottom up, and that wealth is enabling the army, not the other way around, the army bringing wealth into the nation. Now, of course, Scripture attributes that increase in wealth to Jehoshaphat's theological correctness. But archaeologically, what we really see here is a rising tide in the region more generally, both among the Yahwists and the pagan Canaanites. In fact, for all that Judah's wealth is growing, the wealth in Israel, and especially the Phoenician cities, is growing even faster. And Judah is only a second-rate power at this point. Now, climate data is limited and controversial, but we generally assume that at the base of this prosperity is improved agriculture from greater average rainfall than had been prevalent during the centuries of the Bronze Age collapse. In an age when all but a tiny fraction of the population is either farmers or herdsmen, even relatively small shifts multiply themselves over the land, resulting in greater surpluses to feed economic complexity and trade, as well as fewer destabilizing famines. Stability, as well, plays a role here. In the region around Canaan, particularly, there's now only a handful of territorial nations left. War still happens, but far less often than in the prior anarchic periods. And while larger states do make larger battles, the effects of war tend to be far more localized compared to the constant raiding of petty tribes and statelets, allowing people not in the path of the army to develop and accumulate investments. Of course, once the Assyrians come, they're going to be an exception to this, but they're not here yet. And so the amount of capital investment possible for most households, it's, I mean, it's rarely, it's relatively minor compared to how we think about making capital investments in land and tools nowadays. But crucially, these improvements are starting to be enabled by a real proliferation of iron tools. And then, of course, those improvements that are being made they can build on themselves more and more because they're not getting destroyed every generation by bandits, raiders, and warfare. Now, on that iron tools thing, at this phase, iron tools, they're not noticeably superior to bronze, but they are becoming vastly cheaper, we think, thanks to the much greater availability of iron both regionally and worldwide meaning that more people can access them, and they have to sacrifice less to do so. But we shouldn't overstate the power of just iron tools here. The climate improvement is very much the main driver of this prosperity, and the great accelerator here is the structural changes brought about by the resumption of international trade. The relative peace of the era, at least the calming of the low-level banditry and violence through both the policing of the more powerful kingdoms and the good conditions creating less need for banditry, these make it possible to trade surpluses more widely. Most regular surpluses were, of course, traded primarily in a regional setting. It's expensive to transport stuff, but the international luxuries trade, as well as other high-value items like metals, 
could once again in this era span the entire Mediterranean, Near East, and even into Central Asia, which served as a lubricant enriching each of these regional markets. Now, some people do overstate the importance of international trade on its own. But the truth is, as impressive as this interconnected trade web is, it's really cool to find stuff from China over in Western Europe or Western European stuff over in India. That's cool, but the real value of it isn't so much the lapis lazuli or the Greek pottery or the cedar wood that's going to make it into burial chambers and palaces. Rather, the fact of a robust international market allows for specialization and all the attendant benefits of that. Now, imagine that I have a plot of land, and my plot of land is great for olive trees. And my family's always cultivated knowledge of olive cultivation. Now, during the Bronze Age collapse, we probably had a few olive trees around, and we ate the olives, and we traded with our neighbors. But there would have been, in this period, a limit to how many olives we could sell, or how much olive oil or other related products, simply based on the limited needs of the small population around us. And so I can't survive on olives alone. And so a portion of my field, probably the majority of my field, is going to get devoted to grains, which I'm growing at a lower relative efficiency, but well enough to keep my family alive, and that's what really matters. But suddenly, now that traders have access to regions from Mesopotamia all the way to the edge of the earth, there's basically an unlimited market for my goods, and I can dedicate all of my fields to olives. And critically, because I'm specializing in olives, one acre of olive trees can be sold in the market for a certain amount of grain, and we assume that the amount that I can buy is greater than the amount of grain I can grow on that one unspecialized acre. Meanwhile, people in other places can specialize in growing grain. They can grow more than I can manage at lower prices than I could manage, and now they can buy my olives in exchange. In this world where everyone specializes, the whole region grows more calories on the same number of acres, with the same number of people, leading everyone to enjoy greater surpluses on which to buy a variety of new and exciting things. Archaeologically, we start in this period to really see intensive bands of cultivation, where regions start to very strongly specialize based on basically two criteria, the natural preference of certain climates to certain crops, and also the distance to market, with more valuable goods getting grown much closer to the marketplace, and then those markets in turn are largely focused on the great Canaanite ports who have survived the Bronze Age collapse and are starting to transform into remarkable cultural and mercantile centers once again. Now, we talked a bit about those Canaanite port towns along with the rest of Canaan a while back, and we mentioned then that there's a lot that we just don't know because Archaeology fails us in this era for a number of reasons. And that lack of knowledge only gets worse with the general darkness of the Bronze Age collapse. Because of this, what was for most people themselves a relatively smooth transition from the Bronze Age to the Classical Age seems in most histories like a discontinuity, with these people called Canaanites in the Bronze Age being wholly replaced by Israelites, Philistines, Arameans, and Phoenicians. Now, of course, the historians themselves know that there was a continuity here. I mean, the Philistines and the Arameans were certainly outside invaders, and those who've been paying attention will know that the Israelite status is a bit debated. But those Canaanites were essentially the same people as the ones that we're going to start calling, gradually, Phoenicians. And yet there's also an essential difference at the same time between Canaanites 
and Phoenicians. The Phoenician cities, the big five, are Sidon, Tyre, Arwad, Beirut, and Byblos, which is also called Gubla, along with a handful of others along the modern Lebanese, Israeli, and Syrian coast. And these have a different sort of presence in the Iron Age compared to Canaan as a whole in the Bronze Age. And the big difference is that in the Bronze Age, Canaan was an incredibly diverse place. And now in the Iron Age, Canaan is pretty much just that strip of maritime cities along the coast. Now some people, especially really older histories from generations ago, will talk about a retreat to the sea, as if all the people who had been formerly spread throughout inland Canaan had been marched to the coastline and just forced to adapt to being coastal people, but this is just inaccurate. Canaan was never one people, and the inlanders haven't been moved to the sea. They've simply been conquered and either integrated, vassalized, or just killed wherever they were. Were there population movements from inland to the coast? Sure, but they weren't huge. The Canaanites on the sea, who we know of as Phoenicians because the Greeks were so impressed by their purple dye, these guys have always been there. And indeed, Byblos is one of the oldest cities in the world by some measures, and they had always been mercantile. And they'd always been sea folk, building ships and sailing them around the Mediterranean. Among these cities, nothing was lost, and relatively little changed about the culture and lifestyle of these people. It's just that the idea of Canaan as a whole has changed from the loss of the inland people to the various invaders. That said, what actually happened to these cities since the end of the Bronze Age is even more obscure in many ways than the story for Israel and the rest of Canaan, since archaeological evidence has been destroyed by millennia of continuous occupation for all these cities. But first, but first, but first, a quick overview of the cities themselves. From north to south, we start with the city of Ugarit, which is up in modern-day Syria, which we saw a good bit of back in the Bronze Age and was completely overrun as part of the Bronze Age collapse. This would have been one of the major Phoenician cities, except that Ugarit is dead. And actually, it's the fact of the city's death that allowed archaeology to recover so much from it. And we see so much of Bronze Age coastal Canaan, and we, the differences between Ugarit and what we usually think of as the Phoenician cities is often that transition from the Bronze Age into the Iron Age. It's really fascinating, but they're also dead. So they don't really matter very much going forward. That's just what happens. The next city going south is Arwad. Biblically, it's Arvad, which is actually a really cute, tiny island off the Syrian coast. Like, the whole city is on an island not that far away. You could probably swim to the coast if you were in good shape. The island is still inhabited today, though it's much diminished in prestige, as it seems to use its pregnable position off the coast to dominate a noticeable section of the coastline as subject towns. Now, the next major town, down quite a ways in Lebanon, is Gubla, which is called Byblos by the Greeks because of its book industry. We saw this town in our earlier Canaanite series quite a lot, as it is truly ancient, even among this very old region, and had long-standing ties with Egypt, building ships for them, selling timber to them, and acting as a way station for trade from the Euphrates to the Nile. In the Iron Age, it has more competition, but it's pretty consistently still one of the top three cities among the Phoenicians, with all of them rising and falling in fortunes over the centuries. 
Now, the next town down is Beirut, which is the modern Lebanese capital, and was, in this time, a distinct fourth or fifth place town, notable but never quite in the league of Byblos, Sidon, and Tyre. The ancient city was, of course, substantially smaller than the modern town. A massive pair of port complexes and a huge temple were uncovered in 2012, one of the most promising finds for the Phoenician region we've had in generations, and was then promptly destroyed by a hotel developer before any major archaeology got permitted. So we'll now probably never have a good sense of the scope and type of commercial activity which made ancient Beirut famous. Then, just a bit further down, is Sidon and Tyre. Sidon being more northerly, but the two towns are only a day's walk apart from each other, and actually there are fragments which suggest they may have shared a king for a few generations, which might be why the idea of Sidon and Tyre are so closely connected in the Bible during certain eras. Also, the fact that they are the most farthest south, closest to Israel and Judah, and therefore the main trading partner out of these Phoenician cities, is also part of what makes them so prominent in the biblical accounts of the northern coastal Canaanites. Tyre is particularly interesting, as it was originally two islands. Then, under the reign of Hiram of Tyre, and that's the one who ruled during David and Solomon's time, the two islands were connected by dumping a whole bunch of dirt between them to make one larger island. Then, during Alexander the Great's conquest, a thousand years later, he turned it into a peninsula by dumping even more dirt between the mainland and the island while under constant fire reshaping the very earth beneath his feet in order to conquer the world. Alexander was great. I really want to do a podcast on him, but that's a long way away. Anyway, for most of Phoenician history, and Phoenician in this context really gets started around 1000 or 900 BCE, either Sidon or Tyre, or both, were the wealthiest of the coastal cities. And they were both the most active international sailors and the greatest colonizers. Now, I'm going to tell you the story of, all this, of how all this Phoenician colonization happened, but we have to get two things straight first. First, I'm calling them Phoenician, but there were never any Phoenician people. They never called themselves that, and as far as we can tell, the group of cities we're talking about never saw themselves as a unit, but rather as individual cities with their own interests. It's only outsiders looking at them from a distance who see them as a unit of towns with similar culture and economy, but never any sort of political unification. The closest we really get is Sidon and Tyre being unified under a single king for a while. Second, we're going to call the most famous thing that they did, which is establishing cities around the Mediterranean, as colonization. But colonization is itself a pretty politically charged idea nowadays, and as we're going to see, what they were doing is something in some ways similar but in many ways distinct from how the more contemporary sorts of colonization occurred. So with all that out of the way, the story of Phoenician colonization, bearing in mind there were no Phoenicians and they weren't doing colonization, began way back in the Bronze Age. We don't know why or when the maritime city-states of the Levant began to build seaworthy vessels, but it's pretty clear, even in the old kingdom of Egypt, that Byblos possessed a reputation for seagoing and ship construction. One economic speculation for this is that it all began with fishing. While the land-based peoples of Canaan were constantly fighting over scraps of marginal territory to expand their arable land, 
the coastal towns could reach out for more calories through fishing on a sea that was largely uncontested. And to this, the coincidence that they happened to live right next to some of the best shipbuilding lumber in the world in the form of the famous Lebanese cedars. And before recorded history really gets underway, we already have a thriving seafaring people. Economically, they realize very early on that while there's still value in land-based hinterlands, and they do operate in Canaan as military powers to a certain degree, there's far more value on the high seas, from the uncontested fishing to international trade. Now, the first major trading partner for the first major trading city was Egypt, since it was easy enough for these new seafarers to just sail right up the Nile. But already in the Bronze Age, the Near East as a whole has a sense that there exists a western edge of the world, where land simply drops off and never resumes. Biblically, this is called Tarshish, which is rush, roughly western Spain. And since most Near Easterners only ever traveled on land, and they, you can't get from the Near East to Spain on foot in any real systematic fashion in this era, this geographical understanding has to have come from the Phoenicians, who are already traveling throughout the region, and possibly up the Atlantic coast as far as Britain and Denmark. Now, we aren't sure about this last claim, and indeed, there are some remarkable and never really confirmed stories about how far the most adventurous Phoenicians were able to sail. Some think they may have circumnavigated Africa prior to the Bronze Age collapse. Some think that they may have circumnavigated Europe in the biblical era, following various Russian rivers to get from the Baltic back down to the Black Sea. I even heard a Mesoamerica professor here at the University of Texas, the guy that does the Great Courses History of Central America, suggest that there may have been at least one Phoenician and pre-classical Mayan contact sometime between 600 and 400 BCE. And now, all these possibilities are pretty thrilling, which... It's exciting, that's why I bring them up, but they're ultimately speculation, at least for now, and it's no good to pile speculation upon speculation. The point is that these maritime cities already have two material advantages. They have an economic incentive to pursue wealth on the uncontested seas rather than the crowded and often marginal lands of Canaan, and they have the materials, harbors, and skills to build the best boats of the ancient Near East. But if even a fraction of these more outlandish tales are true, then they also possess something on top of all of that. Something best understood as cultural or psychological. Perhaps a love of adventure or a love of the sea, which elevates their mere maritime advantage into something that becomes defining of them as a people. And so fishing has turned into adventuring, which has turned into trade, first with Egypt, then with progressively more distant peoples. We shouldn't oversell this distant adventuring, especially not in the early days, as Canaanite traders are at this point mostly in evidence in Egypt and Greece, with very occasional sightings further west during the Bronze Age. But if there were maritime adventurers in evidence anywhere, well, these adventures were clearly a major step in the whole process. Pretty much anywhere they went, they would find something that they could trade. And in the beginning, it would start with individual ships making individual exchanges just wherever profit and perhaps adventure could be found. Once a merchant or his family, clan, or wider group had identified a good spot with some solid profit to be made, 
they'd start stationing some men in that destination city, living there part of the year or all of the year, in order for those men to have more time to make exchanges with the locals, which would all get picked up by the ships, who could get in and out of port faster, and they wouldn't be held hostage quite so much to the needs of the ship schedules, and therefore you'd get a more reliable profit. Over time, what we see is that these sorts of Phoenician trading offices get gradually expanded in many towns to incorporate more and more Phoenicians doing the trading, and also to start putting some value added into the local product either for export across the sea or sometimes just using Levantine know-how to produce higher quality goods just in the local and regional markets. Now these trading offices get turned into ethnic enclaves as more and more people enter in, steadily growing as one node in an international network. Sure, they make pottery, they refine dyes, or they do a number of other local goods in any one colony, but the fact that this enclave is connected with both the mother city and many other similar enclaves makes that more valuable. A Phoenician merchant might know a guy in Spain, and another guy in Sicily, and another guy back in Tyre, all of whom could potentially buy or sell to his, say, North African colony. This is, in a way, rather similar to the network of diaspora Jews in the European Middle Ages. Being nearly universally literate thanks to their religious education, they had advantages over most people in law and banking and merchanting and similar professions. But the fact that there were specialized Jewish communities all throughout Europe, all in similar economic situations, and all communicating with each other, created a significant economic opportunity for them. Now, the Jews, they're not a perfect analogy here. We don't know of any anti-Phoenician pogroms such as plagued the Jews, but the network effects were powerful enough to make these Levantine cities far wealthier than all but the greatest of imperial capitals, and all that without a great deal of conquering. Now, that isn't to say that the Phoenician cities never did any conquering at all. Pretty much through the end of the Bronze Age and until the Assyrian conquest, vanishingly little of their complex political history is known to us. The cities were largely independent, both of each other and of any major power, and we assume that their relative borders remained generally static, with gains and losses being in the distant enough hinterland that the cities were never significantly threatened. We do hear about them sending some armies. For instance, Arwad sent 200 men to fight the Battle of Karkar, and we assume that they must have defended themselves against all manner of threats, but for the most part, they are remarkably unmilitarized in this chaotic and violent era, except, of course, for, we assume, the constant need for self-defense. Now, one exception to this lack of military activity was a fellow named Itho Baal. Now, we know very little about him, except that he seems to have been some sort of priest of Astarte. But right around the same time that Omri was taking over and establishing his dynasty in Israel, Itho Baal was doing the same thing in Tyre. And just as Omri proper, promptly followed up his own seizure of power with some external conquest, Itho Baal also conquered at least some noticeable amount of territory. And while the amount seized is open to debate, he definitely united Tyre and Sidon together under his leadership, a union which would last a good number of generations after. Almost as important, Itho Baal was also the father of Jezebel, who would become the wife of Israelite King Ahab. 
Now, this alliance would, of course, secure the Tyrian Eastern Front, important for a kingdom that was still probably not a great military power, despite whatever nearby conquests he'd managed. But more importantly, it would secure trade access across that border, effectively opening up more hinterland for Sidon. Now, you would think, naturally, that Israelite land would be the hinterland for Samaria or the other northern cities. But archaeologically, and this is really interesting, you'd be wrong. The western chunk of Israel became quite wealthy in this period, producing specialty goods like wines and oils, pottery, and even grains, which largely seemed to have been exported out through the Phoenician coast. Judah, in contrast, remained noticeably poorer throughout this period, even as they are getting wealthy now, because their land was smaller and less productive, but also because they had no major exporting hubs, as the Philistines on Judah's coast were both more hostile and less mercantile. Still, Judah did manage to ride the rising tide, which, remember, originated with greater state security on land, stamping out bandits, greater international trade overseas through the Philistine cities, and improved climate conditions. Jehoshaphat is recorded in the Bible as having had enough wealth to attempt to build a little fleet and to send it out on one of these trade expeditions. And we should contextualize this here. In modern terms, sending out an ancient trade fleet is a bit like trying to put a satellite in orbit nowadays. It's something that's technically possible, and it's done by some countries pretty regularly. And yet it's still quite expensive, and it's fairly risky, and many smaller nations struggle to manage it, putting in the effort as much for national glory as for the economic benefits. Jehoshaphat's joint expedition with Israel is a bit unclear in its details. The most common interpretation of the place names would have it starting in the Gulf of Aqaba on the Red Sea and then somehow circumnavigating Africa to reach Tarshish in Spain, which seems a bit ambitious for a first go, but whatever was intended here, the expedition failed being destroyed in a storm while still in port because of the wrath of God. And that's the last we hear of Jehoshaphat. But fans of the Phoenicians will notice that we have skipped over the last crucially important detail on their history in this era. You see, we're only a few decades away, by some estimates, to the founding of the city of Carthage. And that seems like an important detail. Suddenly, in places as far away as Spain and North Africa, these Phoenician trading districts and ethnic enclaves are starting to build up agricultural land and actually dominate the nearby cities. We don't, for the most part, hear about violence being involved in this. Rather, it seems that, at least in some cases, that the trading port has gotten wealthy enough to start buying up land, and in many cases either just buys up most of the city, or ends up moving a few miles down the road to build their own city. Now most of these colonial cities, they don't grow to be the size of Carthage, but in this manner a whole network grows over the Mediterranean basin. Not all at once, mind you, and not in any coordinated manner. So there are areas with no Phoenician presence, just the occasional merchant ship. And there are areas with Sidonian or Gublin quarters. There are independent towns founded by Tyrians. And later there's the growing Carthaginian territorial empire, at times all existing at once. And aside from Carthage's empire, these are all functionally independent of each other, bound together at the social cultural and mercantile level, not the political or military level. Now, it's extremely hard to put dates on the Phoenician colonization process. It seems likely that Hiram of Tyre, contemporary with David and Solomon around 1000 BCE, lived 
around the starting point where the commercial contacts were starting to turn into more long-term colonies. And by our point in the narrative, the 800s BCE, proper Phoenician colony towns are definitely being founded. But also in the 800s, there's another parallel colonization process getting started, which actually ends up having more effect on Western history. That is, of course, Greek colonization, especially of Anatolia, southern Italy, and the Black Sea. And that was a very different beast than Phoenician colonization. The impetus there was principally population pressures in Greece. And the process didn't directly involve trade, though, of course, trade was a major result. Greek cities would send a whole chunk of population to some place or another with the intent that they would then found another city in the wilderness. This colony would displace whatever natives were there, at least in theory, and run self-sufficiently. The fact that the colony would send some amount of resources, usually food, to the mother city was an expected part of how the colony would pay the mother city back. And while there were emporions, which were trade-focused colonies, these two were cities first, and appear to lack the natural evolution that characterized so many Phoenician settlements. Now, these few hundred years, from about 1200 to 700, are in many ways the golden age of the Phoenicians, though they do have some more good centuries, really until Alexander the Great comes around, and simultaneously the Romans and Carthaginians push the Western Mediterranean out of their reach. I bring them into our discussion today, partly because it's cool and I like it and it's fun, but also because we're starting to get into a mercantilely prosperous era. And the scope of that prosperity, indeed the scope of the entire known world, is taking a pretty sizable step up in a number of ways. It's like we're zooming out. Not in wholly novel ways, we saw mercantile colonies develop under the Assyrian Mercantile Empire a thousand years earlier. But they were much closer in, and never had time to develop like the Iron Age colonial wave did. Similarly, we've seen territorial kingdoms and empires before, but the scope of the Assyrian Empire, which is now on the horizon, hungrily eyeing the mercantile prosperity developing here in the Levant, is similarly an unprecedented step up from anything the world has seen before. The people of the ancient Near East, they didn't believe in progress. This includes the biblical Jews, by the way. Depending on one's outlook, things now were ba either basically the same as they'd always been, based on patterns that had been handed down by God or the gods, or they had gotten worse, falling from some divine perfection due to human failings. We can see progress because we usually speed through thousands of years at a time, mentioning agriculture, animal domestication, urbanization, all in one quick breath, with literacy, soon after, and then boom, Greek philosophy. And that all took me like one sentence to say, whereas in modern times, We've had massive AI developments over the last year, and that feels like a lot. Yet, one year is way slower than the one sentence that it takes to mention all these prehistoric advancements. So obviously, progress was just as obvious back then as it is today. No, no, in all seriousness, the ancient people knew that a person could improve their life or that a nation could be improved by better kings, or even that other methods could be adopted for farming and crafting. But the idea of sustained progress over time that would change life itself, that was fundamentally outside their conceptual framework. And that matters a lot, because they're living through a major economic shift, largely without realizing it, probably the fastest shift that's happened in world history 
up to this point. I, anyway, I'm, I don't know, really know where... where that's, that matters. That, I promise that that matters. But the point is that going forward, Judah is now a wealthy, settled society. And Israel is even wealthier. And their neighbors on the coast are wealthier still. But this outlook thing, it matters because it's going to shape people's decisions and their outlook. And even once the Assyrians get here, it's going to shape them as well. Indeed, we already know that these are not the hard scrabble hobby room warriors of Joshua's age, but a complex and developing society. And that seems to play in to the messages of the prophets that are coming in at about this time. And no one really seems to recognize that they're not hobby room anymore. But of course, they know that they're not. It's all quite confusing. But of course, like all complex societies of the ancient world, they're going to use most of that complexity to kill each other in new and complicated ways, more than anything else that goes on. So join us next time as the Yahwist faction properly takes over from their religious and political enemies through piety, God's blessings, and mass international slaughter. Thank you for listening.